Okay, the last uh, two presentations of this uh, masterclass have all got to do with what goes on inside uh, tumbling mills. Um, motion in the mill is, uh, is related to basically power draw and the motion of those elements inside the mill also calls wear. So we're looking at those two aspects or as much as we know, or at least as much as I know about those two aspects. In one of the cases, I think I know a reasonable amount, but in the other case, I know I don't know a huge amount and I'll try and share with you as much as I have been able to extract and that is on where from the literature and the little work I've done in that area. My PhD thesis was done on power modelling and as all good PhD and master students know, the first thing you've got to do is a literature review to see what was done previously. And I started this work in 1990 and I went back to the turn of the century. And uh, in that time, in those 90 years, I found over 30 papers by different people on predicting power draw. Um, there was at least 10 models, um, all but two of them, perhaps not surprisingly, had to do with ball mills. Um, once I started breaking down the models, it all looked like, apart from maybe one, it was the same model being used over and over and over and over again, with a few little bits and pieces bolted on to the edge to make them slightly different. But the essential principles were the same. And one of the biggest problems I found, and as a, as a researcher, which is what I was then as a PhD student, no validation data whatsoever. So there are all these models by researchers saying, here's my model, but nobody had taken the trouble to see whether they actually worked or not. The only one that had done anything in that field again is Bond, and Bond also had a power draw model, but Bond never published any of his data. So from a student's viewpoint, there was nothing out there. And I, one of the jobs I had to do was go and collect it from, from plants. The basic model that was used up until that point looked something like this. It was called the torque arm approach. And the underlying assumption was that the charge inside the mill sat like that. And it had an angle of repose, the, the angle A or alpha. And if you portrayed that charge as a solid, and that is the centroid of that solid with a mass M, then if you looked at a classic torque equation, and the definition of torque is force times distance rotation, power is torque times 2 pi times n, which is the rate of rotation. That is straight classic physics. If we apply it to this centroid here, therefore we have the mass times the gravitational constant g. Rg is the distance between that centroid and the centre, and Rg sine a is that distance there. And so power draw, and that is the simplest power draw model you could possibly come up with, was the basis of just about all those other models. One of the underlying assumptions as well of this was that this charge was moving at the same rate as the periphery of that mill, and that the elements in that charge were effectively locked together. So having collected some data, um, I took some of the published models, Bond, a guy called Austin, Rose and Evans, back in 1930-something they did some work, Arbiter and Harris. There were some other models by Furstenau. Um, uh, I, I forget some of the other ones, but they all basically used exactly the same as uh, Arbiter and Harris, Austin um, and, uh, and Bond. 
And here are the predictions of their models. And they have the trend in the right direction. None of them sit on the line, which is where they should do. And some of them have significant amounts of scatter. So I'm putting these up. And the reason I generated this from a PhD viewpoint was simply that you can't get a PhD if all those points were on the line then there went my PhD basically because I could simply argue that somebody else has previously done it. So it was my job as a PhD student to try and develop something so that all the points were on that line and there was a lot less scatter and that's what I set out to do. One of the first things I was interested in doing was to see whether the charge actually looked like that. So I built myself a glass mill and I put some rocks in because I was interested in rocks. I put some lifters in and I started taking lots and lots and lots and lots of photographs. And my first look was that that shape was not appropriate and that probably the best shape was defined by these slices. Um, and that was the basis of one of the models I developed. I developed three for my PhD thesis. This was a really complex model. Uh, I had to write quite a, for the time, quite a sophisticated program because I looked at each of these slices in turn and their influence on the power draw, but then realized after doing a few calculations, I could do it much simpler by assuming that shape. I know it's not exactly the same shape, but from a mathematical viewpoint, and I can assure you my math is not very good. From a mathematical viewpoint, that was relatively easy to describe. You might wonder why I chose to take the photographs this way. They have a long exposure. And the reason is I was interested in these white particles, which I'd put in on purpose was to see how long these smears were. Because obviously this is a particle, but with a long exposure, uh, it's blurred it. The length of that blur is proportional to the velocity of that particle. And I was really interested to work out what the velocity field was in that. And what I found was that there was a velocity gradient from here right the way out to the edge and that these were not locked. Basically, each of those layers is sliding over one another at a different, different velocity. So I spent hours and hours and hours and hours as a student with photographs and a ruler measuring and measuring and measuring and measuring and measuring all of these lines everywhere until I could build up a velocity vector field and put together some equations which described how they varied. Once I had that, most of the job was cracked really, because if you look at that element there, from physics viewpoint, it's fairly easy to work out what the power draw is going back to first principles associated with that element. Once I knew that, all I needed to do was integrate between this surface and that surface and I had a power draw model. And that's the basic equation for a rotating cylinder. Don't worry about the details in here, but it's got all the elements that you could expect. Velocity, the length of the cylinder, that's the density of the charge, that's the radius gravitational constant. Theta S is the angle of the shoulder, which defines that point. Theta T defines that point. So in its basic form, actually it's a double integral. So I've already done the first integral there to get me from that point through to that point. The last bit of the integral is to go from this inner surface here, where the velocity is effectively zero, out to here. What was interesting looking at the literature uh, was that 
Um, yes, there were models out there. Most of them were for ball mills. There was a view somehow that ag mills power draw and sag mills power draw was different. So hence, a couple of researchers said, oh, we can't use ball mill power draw models. We're going to have to develop a new one, an ag and a sag mill. And those people that had developed ball mill models said, oh, we need a correction factor for overflow versus great discharge ball mills. And there's no doubt that if you look at raw data, you look at real data from great discharge versus overflow ball mills, overflow ball mills of the same size as a great discharge with the same ball load, same speed, same everything, they do draw less power. It is significantly less power. And all previous researchers simply had a correction factor for, for that situation. Again, from a PhD viewpoint, um, I was told by my supervisor, the examiner is not going to accept, uh, I'll just put in a correction factor, it's not good enough for a doctorate, you've got to work out why that is. So it was something else I had to consider as part of my PhD. The answer to that is I'm going to just, uh, you might think, go off the beaten track a bit, but you'll see why I'm going back to, remember what I said, my master's thesis, I had to study some mills at Alcoa back in 1989. I was six months on site uh, studying uh, that mill and surveying it over and over again, sitting in the control room for hours and hours on end. And they allowed me every now and again to stick my head in when we stopped the mill to see what it looked like. Uh, nowadays, uh, I don't think mines allow you to do that anymore, but in those days, uh, one was allowed to do that. And that's what that's typically what I used to see inside of the mill. Now, I was a young graduate then. I, had, I didn't know much about milling. I thought all mills were like this. It was just a sea of bubbles and slurry and water, and I thought, oh, that must, that must be normal. And I didn't, really didn't think anything of it. What I did notice, and it was a minor part of my master's thesis, I'd been sitting in the control room, as I said, for hours on end and talking to the uh, control operators, and the mills in this circuit were single stage. So they did everything in one mill, and they ground down, I think, to about 150 microns. They had a lot of flow meters in the recirculating load around the cyclones, and it was as clear as daylight Whenever the recirculating load from the graph plots used to climb, the power draw used to go in exactly the opposite direction. So I thought it was really neat, interesting. Um, and from the data, I put together this very simple and very crude model. And this was just fitting it. They had a load cell there. So it was the power draw was some constant plus something to do with the load cell minus the recirculating load flow. There was something there. And uh, again, my supervisor said, well, you can't just leave it like that. You've got to say something. What do you think the recycle load was for? And I'm embarrassed by what I put down there. It was some drivel that I put in there just to keep the uh, examiners uh, uh, happy. And when I look back at it, I thought, well, that was obviously not the case. However, it stuck in my mind. And it was years later that I was asked to go to a brand new single stage ag mill. Um, it was the Leinster Nickel operation in Western Australia. It was 32 feet. They just commissioned it. And I knew the people uh, there. I hadn't designed the mill. And they said, look, Steve, could I come? Because their power draw was just way down and they could not draw the power and they were really, really worried. So I went to site and uh, this is a snapshot of a particular period uh, of the operation. You can see it was back in 1993. So I don't have the original data, so I can't redraw this graph. Um, so it, it shows its age. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is that is the power draw going along, fairly constant. That there is the load in the mill. They had a load cell. And can you see what's happened here? Load has gone down and the power here has spiked. Now the reason for that is they stopped the feed at this point here. The mill kept on going round. So stop the feed, 
What's the first thing that happens in any mill, particularly an ag mill? You stop the feed, but the ag mill's still turning. The rocks are ground out. So there goes the load going down. Now, using our classic power draw theory, it's the rocks that are drawing the power. The rocks go down. The power draw should follow it. Well, it didn't. It spiked by almost a megawatt. I mean, that is a massive increase in power draw. Once again, in those days, they allowed me to stick my head in and surprise, surprise, there was this pool. And this pool was, it was like a swimming pool. It was absolutely massive. And for me, the light went on when I saw that and I saw that water. If you stop the feed and you were able to look inside that mill, right? We had a camera in there and the mill's going round and there's that big slurry pool. You stop the feed. The first thing that goes out is the slurry. So the slurry disappears first up. The load cell also goes down, but the slurry goes out. And as soon as the slurry goes, the power goes up. And I immediately thought, overflow ball mill. That ag mill was operating like an overflow mill. Overflow ball mills have balls in it and they have a massive pool at one end uh, of the mill because you fill the mill up with slurry until it overflows at the end. So my conclusion was, going back to this Alcoa equation, it wasn't the recycle on its own that was causing the power to go down. Recycle is slurry. And the higher the recycle is, the more slurry was being pumped into that mill. The more slurry that was pumped into that Alcoa mill, the higher became the slurry pool. So the higher the slurry pool, the lower the power draw. So for me, that was it. It's all got to do with the slurry pool. It's got actually nothing to do with the grate, nothing to do with the whether it's a ball mill or an ag mill. It simply has to do with, is there an excess of slurry? Is it causing a pool or not? And that is what drives the difference. If we go back now to the picture, my view of what's inside the mill, this is a picture much more blurred, but I decided to run my, my mill way back then with a bit of water in it. And in this case, there was some excess water so this is our slurry pool. Here's the rock charge. So let's divide rock charge, which is blue, from where the slurry sits. Now we can ignore this part of the charge because if you look at classic physics, if that is symmetrical with respect to the center of rotation and it is perpendicular to it, you can effectively ignore it because it doesn't draw any power. It's basically sitting at the bottom of the mill. So this is the basis of that first part of my model to say that the rock in here, because it is up there on the side of the mill, resists the rotation and that's what causes power draw. This slurry, however, is on the other side of the mill and it actually helps the mill rotate. So it's on the plus side rather than the negative side. So if we go back to our equation, or go back first of all to our view, what we can now say is for a great discharge mill where the grates are working really, really well, we have a relatively dry charge that is there. If we have an ag or a sag mill where there's something wrong at the end of the mill and it can't get the slurry out and it builds up a slurry pool, or we have a ball mill which is operating in overflow mode, then that bit needs to be taken into consideration when we look at power draw. And we can describe the power draw of that in exactly the same way as we looked at for the power draw of the rock part. And that is the formula, it's another integration of the slurry pool. And it has a negative value. So now we can add the two equations together. That's the rock charge. That's the slurry pool. So the same model can be used for whether it's a ball mill 
or an ag mill or a sag mill. And the only difference is if you have a slurry pool, you must invoke that part of the equation. And if you don't, then that simply goes to zero. So that formed the basis of my model. One final part to it is that that previous equation is a theoretical equation and it gives you the net power draw. It gives you the power draw associated with the movement of the media, nothing else. The meter that you have on your plant that records power draw has to overcome friction of the bearings, drivetrain, all sorts of other losses. So you need something to accommodate that. So I decided to go the route of having something what's called a no load power. And a number of those mills, because I was fortunate enough to um, commission some of those new mills, we ran them empty. So I could actually record the so-called no load power, how much energy was going on just for the mechanics to be driven around. And I generated that equation there to um, represent the no load power. This has been criticised in some quarters because if you look at everybody else's power draw, they say that you take the net power draw and then you add a fixed percentage for all the losses. Now, most of them are like that. The problem I have with that is that if you've studied pilot mills, and I've studied lots of them, what you find is that the, and obviously they're small mills, the losses due to the drivetrain proportionally are very high indeed. You can be up to 25% of the energy that you draw goes into overcoming those frictions and the drivetrain. So to me, clearly, those losses are not constant throughout the whole range of mill sizes. And this form at least enables you to, to make recognition of that. At the end of the day, it's interesting when you do the calculations for this, and I should point out, this is all published, um, and the JK Simmet has this model in it. When you do the calculations for this and you work out for an industrial scale mill and you work out what that is as a percentage of that, it's very near to what all the other modelers assume is uh, roughly what all the losses are, which is somewhere around between 7 and 10%. So it doesn't depart significantly. It just makes this one for small mills, in my view, an awful lot more accurate. Well, so how accurate it is? Uh, well, my database now, we've got 154 different mills around the world. 74 of them are ball mills, 80 are ag and sag. They go down to pilot scale ball mills and sag mills that draw only six kilowatts up into mills that draw 20,000 kilowatts. So we have a really big range and uh, that's what I got my PhD thesis on basically. Um, it was interesting. I, um, I had a friend who works in the uh, researcher to do with things more on the biological side. And the first thing he said to me was, Steve, you're cheating. He said, that's, that's too good. Because on the biological side of things, you know, when you're doing experiments with, with plants and animals and so on, it's really difficult to get conclusive results. And I said to him, no, it's not cheating. It's recognition of the fact that physics applies everywhere. And if you've described the physics in a rotating vessel correctly, and you've got decent data, if there wasn't that tight situation, and you could argue, well, you haven't got the physics correct. So it's just a statement of the fact that mills are simply, as I said earlier, cylindrical vessels with cylindrical, uh, spherical, I should say, particles of some description just going round and round and round. And frankly, it's not a difficult physics. There has been a suggestion in the literature that the model is not as good in ag mills. I can't find that anywhere. They're the ag mills. I have got a number of mills in my database, ag and sag mills, which had slurry pools. Uh, I worked on those mills. I was allowed to measure the slurry pools.
And what I want to show you here is potentially the effect of a slurry pool. These are ag and sag mills from quite big ones to quite small ones. If in the model we simply ignore the slurry pool, we say it doesn't exist or we don't believe the slurry pool has any effect whatsoever and we use my model, then you end up with that observed versus predicted. And you can see these points up here and also down here are not on that line. When you put in the second part of that equation, then you find that all those points come back on the line. I can show you this is not fiddling, um, as I said, and it's, it's not due to any brilliance on my part. It just simply is physics described correctly. Okay, so that's the power draw. 